Welcome everybody uh, to this C3 Collaborating for Health uh, International Seminar with Dr. Alafia Samuels and on World Obesity Day. C3 is a global health charity headquartered in London, uh, but working across all continents. And I think we have people joining us um, from across the world, other than uh, parts of the world that are fast asleep. Um, and we're really delighted uh, to have uh, Dr. Samuels with us today to celebrate or to recognize World Obesity Day. So C3 is a charity focused on the prevention of chronic disease with a real attention to the risk factors. And we work in a number of ways. We're probably known for the way we work across all sectors with diverse groups. And we have particular program areas that we uh, focus on, one of which is our community engagement program. And we are at the moment working on a big uh, EU, European Union project um, on the links between obesity and unemployment in southern, parts of southern England and northern France. Um, and we have a number of other ways of working, but that is uh, one that we're particularly interested in at the moment. So uh, Alafia's presentation and her involvement with us will be great. We also have, um, and I'm conscious that we have people on the call today um, from my ethnic minority groups in the UK. And we have a, a program developing, working with uh, diaspora, with people in North and West London, with um, African, Caribbean and Asian heritage with nurses uh, to consider their own health issues, but also to work with them to reach into their communities where we've always known that people were most vulnerable to chronic disease. And the pandemic, COVID-19, has really shown in this country and in others how people from minority backgrounds have been especially vulnerable. So, Dr. Samuels, we're ready to hear from. Uh, she has a fantastic um, background, career, publications. She's currently chair of NCD Child, who we enjoy working with. And I'm particularly delighted by the Lancet's uh, definition of her as the first fast food watchdog of the Caribbean. And I have to say where I am in Camden Town, we need a fast food watchdog here. Alapia, over to you, and uh, we're all ready to hear from you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, I am speaking to you from Jamaica, and actually I live on the North Coast, which is a tourist area, so I, I'm very privileged to, to live where others holiday. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about um, sugar wanted to talk specifically about sugar. There's a lot of talk about sugar. What's the, what's the problem? What's the big deal? Why are we concerned? Well, let me start off with the question of obesity and um, looking at the countries in the world. This is, the data is a little old, but it hasn't changed too much. Um, where the, the, the um, countries with the highest burden of obesity. And you can see that most of them are small island developing states. So you have the Pacific, all of the top seven are Pacific, six are Pacific islands, and then you will have Jamaican, um, Caribbean islands um, on the other side. So there's something happening with the small island developing states. So what are these small island developing states? They are mostly British colonies and mostly in the Caribbean and in the Pacific, um, some off of the coast of Africa, and they have some common um, vulnerabilities of course, we know about climate change and, and hazards, economically vulnerable, or often high reliance on a single industry. So some of these countries in the Pacific and the Caribbean are middle income countries. In fact, in the Caribbean, half of our countries are high income countries, um, but it's based on tourism. And so um, a, a, a unstable base and COVID certainly <laughs> showed us that. So for, for this discussion, the question of being nutritionally vulnerable, 
with high levels of nutritionally related diseases. You know that obesity and diabetes are highest in the Pacific Islands. Caribbean islands are following right behind them. Um, and this is happening in both adults and in children. And in fact, um, you see that there is a link between the food systems and the obesity in both the Caribbean and Pacific, where you can see the on the right, the food import dependence ratio. So what proportion of your food is imported? And the Caribbean shows an average, but there's one country in the Caribbean, St. Kitts and Nevis, that imports 90% of what their citizens consume. And of course, this is related to economies of scale, being in small islands, not being able to grow um, you know, at scale and the diversity and so on. So um, yes, we are importing a lot of food and yes, we are obese and where does sugar fit into all of this? Just to remind you that sugar comes in multiple forms. Everything you see here labeled as all of these different things are sugar and a lot of processed foods have in sugar. I mean, the other day I opened a tin of um, spicy tuna and discovered that the spicy tuna had sugar in it. So there is sugar everywhere. There is the sugar that we see, and then there's the sugar that we don't see. That's in all of these products that are on the shelves. Um, it's a good uh, preservative and it's cheap and most people add it to almost everything. So one of the issues we need to address is the question of the presentation of sugar. So is all sugar created equal? Um, and no, it's not. So one of the issues with the sugar sweetened beverages is um, that it is, is very costly to your body. So a 12 ounce can, um, you know, once per day gives you 15 pounds of, of weight each year. And to burn that off, you have to walk 1.5 miles um, for one can of soda because it has 90 spoons of sugar. Um, so this is very concentrated in just one can. And fruit juices, uh, some of them have just as much or more sugar than the soda. And it's added sugar that we are concerned about. Um, oh, this didn't come out well. This is supposed to be a colored map. Um, that tells you where, is it really going to do? Oh, I see. All right. Um, <laughs> so this is showing you the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. And of course, the Caribbean and Pacific Islands are barely visible. But you can see that, for example, in the Caribbean, we are surrounded by Mexico. And, and these, these are actually Caribbean. This is Guyana and Suriname down here. Um, and you can barely see Jamaica there. Um, but I can assure you there are islands right here and they are all dark red in terms of consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. Um, so we are challenged. And to just demonstrate how challenged we are, this is a graph from the Global Dietary Database and it's looking at different types of foods consumed at different age groups. So we start on the left with the newborns and then we end up with the 80 year olds on the X axis. And on the Y axis is the actual number of calories. And globally, you can see the pattern. Um, sugar is in red. And you see that at age 10 is the time when you know the most consumption of sugar sweetened beverages is going on. Um, and you can see that the pattern over time. When you look at the Caribbean, it's literally off the charts. So you can see it's the same scale that we used for the world. This is the Caribbean. And this is what is happening with consumption of sugar. Um, ridiculous, right? So you understand why um, there is some focus on sugar in the Caribbean. One of the things we do um, is to do demonstrations to show people how much sugar is actually in um, the stuff they're, they're buying. So the Coca-Cola is not so much of a surprise. The, the bag above, people know there's a lot of sugar in Coke. But the Pine Hill Fruit Punch is what people always are, are staggered by. Because they see fruit, they think healthy, and they have no idea that that's the amount of sugar that's in that, um, that thing. And they give it to their children to go to school because they think it's healthy and it's the right thing to do. 
Um, so to show people graphically is very important. And, you know, the artificial sweeteners are not really the answer to our problem um, because we know that they have um, issues, even those that are not carcinogenic. We know that they um, make your gut think that high calorie food is on the way. And so it affects your hunger signals um, and it will release insulin and cravings and also will increase the risk of type two diabetes. Um, and well, maybe this is a circular argument because those who are overweight are trying to lose weight and so they drink diet soda, but because they're drinking that, okay, so. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so we talked about the importance of looking at sugar and um, sugar in beverages. Um, why are we concerned about that? Well, first of all, these sugars, all sugars are not created equal. Glucose is the sort of base sugar and everything is converted to glucose to be used in your body. Sucrose comes from sugar beets and sugar cane and fructose comes from fruit. So the sugar in fruit and the sugar in sugar cane are different sugars. Um, so that's one thing to note. Um, and then this, the second thing is the, the, the breakdown. And as I said, everything is broken down to glucose, which you can absorb and use. But if the sugar is presented in a large molecule, there is a slow, extensive breakdown and a slow rise in blood sugar. But simple sugars, especially sugars just added to water, which is basically what sugar sweetened beverages are, sodas anyway, um, these simple sugars are absorbed immediately into the bloodstream and give a quick, rapid rise in blood sugar. And that is the issue, um, why it's such a problem. So here, here are two graphs um, that are showing you what happens um, when you have what we call a low glycemic index food versus high glycemic index. So glycemic index would be the rate at which um, the sugar is released into the bloodstream. So the low ones release slowly. And so here you see on the left, uh, a good match between the blood glucose and the insulin. Of course, insulin is released so that you can use the, the, the blood sugar. On the right, when you drink a soda and you have this very rapid rise in um, blood sugar, you have a corresponding rapid rise in insulin and then see what happens to the blood glucose. It plunges down below zero. So you go from a sugar rush to a sugar crash. And the sugar crash when you're below zero it induces craving. So you want more sugar. So you start a kind of vicious cycle. So this is the issue with sugar sweetened beverages, the, the very rapid rise here in blood sugar. And so the glycemic index, this slide should have come before the last slide, right? Um, <laughs> the, the glycemic index, as I said, is how you classify um, sugar uh, um, foods in terms of their um, absorption. So in summary, added sugar in drinks, what's the problem? First of all, calories from drinks do not satisfy hunger because there's no feeling of fullness. So even if you have 500 calories worth of a drink, you are still hungry. So basically you've wasted those calories because they're not um, satisfying your hunger. Then there are empty calories, as we said, sugar added to sugar sweetened beverages, you know, most of them, the, the sodas and, and so on. Um, the only thing in them is some fruit coloring, sugar and water. So empty calories, you're not getting anything else. And then we just talked about the rapid rise um, causing a spike in blood sugar and in, in insulin. So that's dangerous calories. So these are wasted, empty, dangerous calories. So really um, the world could do quite well without um, these products. The association between sugar sweetened beverages and weight gain is stronger than for any other food group. And it's the leading cause of obesity and the resulting diabetes and heart disease in both adults and children. So it's a, it's a big deal. And what's happening is, you know, we talked about small island states in the, in the start of the, 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 the presentation. And um, this is change in the rates of obesity in small island developing states. And topping it in green is the Pacific and right behind is the, is the Caribbean. So both areas have very significant rises 
um, in childhood obesity. And, uh, you know, obviously this has health impact. Um, premature death from obesity and overweight is second only to, back to tobacco in the USA. It is estimated it will surpass tobacco as a leading cause of death in the next decade. But in the Caribbean and in small island developing states, it is already the leading cause of premature um, death in small island developing states. So the health, health impacts, we talked about um, sugar sweetened beverages causing obesity, dental cavities, the sugar that sits on the teeth um, and, and causes that, and gout, liver disease, heart disease, and one sugar sweetened beverage per day increases diabetes risk by 18%. Two sodas a day double the risk of heart disease. Um, and here we have all the diseases that we can consider um, nutrition related diseases. Um, and in the Caribbean, that's 57% of mortality. So what is driving this obesity? Well, you know, we were hunter gatherers and then we stopped hunting and gathering natural food, food coming out of the earth and we became manufacturers. So we started manufacturing food um, and we are sitting at our desk as we, most of us are probably sitting right now and spend, a, <clears throat> sorry, a lot of time sitting. Um, and so we are inactive and eating the wrong food. Now, just one thing to say that there is a, 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 a myth being propagated that you can eat whatever you want, you just need to exercise more. But people are not aware, first of all, of the detrimental impact of some of the foods that they eat. But even in terms of exercising alone, um, it takes two hours of walking to burn off 500 calories, which is just a small you know, piece of chocolate and some chips. Um, so most of us who have sedentary intellectual desk type jobs, do not have lifestyles that will allow us to do the amount of physical activity every day to burn off the amount of excess calories that we're eating. And that's why obesity is increasing. This slide is not meant, we are not going to talk about this slide. We, this is just showing you that it's a very complex pathway, interrelated pathway from sugar sweetened beverage consumption to obesity, diabetes, coronary heart disease and dental cavities. Many ways you'll get there. Um, so it's a, it's a problem. So why is it in fact that the dietary patterns have changed over time and um, we, our eating patterns have changed? And basically it has to do with commercial interests and what we call the commercial determinants of health. So increased consumption of processed foods and drinks um, which track closely with rising levels of obesity is um, what the food industry and the drink industry is doing in the same way that alcohol, uh, that the um, tobacco industry um, did in the past in terms of, of managing. So efforts to prevent non-communicable diseases go against business interests of powerful economic operators. This is one of the biggest challenges facing health promotion it's not just big tobacco anymore, but big food, big soda, and big alcohol. All of these industries fear regulation and protect themselves using the same tactics. And this was Dr. Chan when she was um, Director General of WHO. Okay, so th th these are the companies that feed the world. There are about 10 companies that have about a million brands, but they all come back to these same big 10 companies. And in some countries, these companies provide the majority of the calories that people consume. So what they do is important. And what the impact of that, and this is um, a graph of food imports into CARICOM countries over 20 years. And what happens is that as the countries become, become um, um, more e economically developed, then the demand for um, finished products and products that are used to make fast food increase. And this is, this is what has been happening about food imports into CARICOM countries um, over years. And the same thing is happening in the Pacific. So these, com multi these multinational food and beverage companies promote overconsumption of highly processed, unhealthy food 
and sugary drink for, for profit. And um, the marketing is shifting to um, low and middle income countries. And the dotted line here is showing you the trends in sugar sweetened drinks consumption. Um, and it is, you know, rising. And this is 2010. So a current graph would show even greater um, rates. The global beverage industry spends billions, that's billions with a B, on advertising to entice young consumers and then turns around and blames individuals for not practicing self-control. That's, that's their philosophical approach. And unhealthy food companies target children everywhere. This is from Barbados and their local it's a, like a McDonald's, but it's called Shefet. It's local. And they give all primary school children book covers, pencil cases, blackboards, rulers, erasers, all branded with Shefet. So these children, and you see the age of this child, are in school looking at this logo all day. And the book covers are there with the fried chicken, and they look at the fried chicken all day. So as soon as they are out of school, they want this fried chicken. And this is, you know, how obesity gets institutionalized in countries. The result is that this marketing, 30% um, of children's calories are from unhealthy foods, sweets, drinks, salt, snacks, and so on. And this varies from country to country, of course, but um, it's a very big impact. Okay, so that was the, the terrible situation that we're in. <laughs> Um, what can we do about it and, and how, how can we go forward? So what, what has been happening? So partnership and reformulation is one approach. We have to work with the private sector. They feed the population, not us. And we, we can't forget that over time, the private food industry has played a, a big role in reducing hunger globally um, by making their unhealthy, granted, but making products available and having wide distribution networks and so on. So, you know, they say when you sup with the devil, you use a long spoon, but you still have to sit down and, and break bread because you're trying to address a problem that they are in control of. So um, there has been talk of implementation of warning labels and nutrition information. Um, and we need to recognize conflict of interest. So you use a long spoon when you're having dinner with them. We also need to recognize that the private sector is not uniform. There is a friendly private sector. There are people who are making profit from selling healthy food. There are farmers who grow natural products, retailers, healthy food vendors. These are our partners. We need to form alliances with them. Reformulation is very important in many countries where um, they have brought in laws about, you know, the content that can be in food. Um, you have to reformulate, but you need to verify. Um, so ha happily, Jamaica has recently, for the first time, acquired the capacity for the government agencies to monitor sugar, salt, and fats in foods. And we have been doing so. And just as a sidebar, um, a recent... Um, uh, investigation found that 40% of sampled foods in Jamaica had trans fat. And trans fat has been banned in high income countries because it is known to cause premature death. But it is now being dumped in the Caribbean and other low and middle income countries. And half of what is has trans fat, the label on the, on the thing said trans fat free. So they are lying as well. Um, so you need to be able to, to, to verify. Okay, so what is it then that we are recommending for people? Water, water, tea and coffee, unsweetened, low fat beverages and so on, diet drinks are down there, um, sugar, sugar juices, because even though they may have some sugar, um, they also have the advantages of having other nutrients, um, sugar sweetened beverages, but of course, in, in island states, we're all about the coconut water. Um, and this is a really healthy alternative. It has lots of nutritional stuff. I didn't even put all the slides, but just to remind you also that it has potassium, which is very good for hypertension because we are high salt, low potassium people and it should be the other way around. Um, 
what have countries been doing? So there was this whole push for warning labels um, where your drink would have this black hexagon saying high in sugar. Um, this, um, this kind of warning label was first used in Chile, I believe. And um, we tried to introduce it in the Caribbean, but the manufacturers um, defeated our efforts, unfortunately. Um, Paho even did a, a, a study in Jamaica showing the superiority of this high in sugar label. Um, but um, when it came time to vote, they, it didn't go our way. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, the other thing people can have been doing is marketing regulations in small island developing states. So this is a paper that was written um, with Caribbean and Pacific um, authors. We had some projects we worked on together before. Um, and <clears throat> it shows some of the interventions, it's obesity, generally, but the last column is what I'm showing you, taxes on sugar sweetened beverages that has occurred in a number of countries across the Pacific and the Caribbean. Um, and it has happened across the world. And this is a, a, a map from um, Barry Popkin and company 2021, looking at the countries um, in the different regions that have actually implemented taxes on sugar sweetened beverages which have been quite effective in fact. So let's just look briefly at some of these. So we had Mexico um, where they showed the decline um, of 6% reduction in um, consumption of sugar sweetened beverages after 10% tax on sugar sweetened beverages. Mexico did a much larger wraparound project. Um, they had mass media campaigns, messages like would you drink 12 tablespoons of sugar? Sodas are sweet, diabetes isn't. What's more important, public health or soda industry interests? So as one person put it, public health versus private wealth. Um, in Mexico, they had demonstrations in graveyards. These people are another level of demonstration, um, talking about you know, sugar causing death and so on and so forth. They also did end up um, spending some of the money on water fountains and water at schools and so on to make that more available. In the Caribbean, we have had a lot of response. Barbados and Dominica have raised taxes um, on sugar sweetened beverages, some countries on sugar, um, Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica, I will speak about in a little bit. So this um, Miriam Alvarado did her PhD on evaluating the Barbados sugar sweetened tax in Barbados. Um, and to just set the stage for that, this is a picture of the former prime minister of Barbados. And he was talking about industry pressure to rescind the tax um, on sugar sweetened beverages in Barbados. So, and the direct quote, when we imposed the tax on sugar sweet, on sweet drinks, it was such a shock to those who export sweet drinks to Barbados that a whole delegation flew to Barbados from the USA led by a former governor of a state and including the executives of the sugar companies. Um, I don't know which ones, but I'm thinking Coke, Pepsi, etc. They came in wanting to meet with the prime minister and the minister of health to convince them that they should remove the tax. And that if you remove the tax, they would help us in other ways. The other ways would be promoting physical activity, which they would brand of course, right? So <laughs> they're not giving away anything. Um, but the prime minister said, thanks, but no thanks and imposed the tax on sugar. And so you saw it on the shelf where, you know, you saw the sugar free um, price different from the sugar price. And um, similar to, um, to Mexico, well, not similar because our, our manufacturers only passed through 6% of the tax. Um, so on the shelf, you only saw a 6% differential. You didn't see the 10%. But it led to a decrease in sale of sugar sweetened beverages of 4% and increase in the sale of water by 7.5%. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, um, the Minister of Health imposed a ban on the sale of sugar sweetened beverages in schools. The parents reacted. Minister, you're giving our children prison food. And the minister replied, 
better prison food now than hospital food later. So I think this was a very well made point um, that, you know, there are consequences to what you do. Bermuda is a champion, 75% tax on sugar, right? 75% tax on sugar. Bermuda is a very wealthy country. Um, it's in the top 10 of per capita income in the world, small population and lots of offshore banking, et cetera, et cetera. And they have serious problems with obesity and diabetes. So they went all in, 75%. Um, <clears throat> consumption, the impact, consumption of one or more sugary drinks declined from 50% to 42%, especially among men. Um, there are more sugar-free options in the market. The public discussion on the sugar tax has raised awareness on the harms of sugar consumption and helped to educate the public. And importantly, the sugar tax raised a lot of money. Um, so governments sometimes can be persuaded just on that fact alone. So the soda tax is not a silver bullet. Taxation is one of many instruments available to promote healthier diets and should be seen as a part of a package of policies um, aimed at altering consumer choices. Um, and finally, um, to close out in Jamaica, of course, <laughs> um, the Minister of Health here limited, um, put a limit on sugar in drinks in school in 2019, which was actually implemented. And we were supposed to evaluate it in 2020, but you know what happened in 2020. Um, he also had planned to limit salt and fats in school in 2020, but that obviously has been delayed. Jamaica does not really have an appetite for taxes on sugar sweetened beverages. But what we did have is a big media campaign financed by Vital Strategies, which is basically Michael Bloomberg, mayor of New York, former mayor of New York. And um, I'm going to end this presentation by sharing with you, um, Jake, if you can, please, the video um, from Jamaica advertising, talking about sugar sweetened beverages. Should I stop sharing my screen and then you can do it? I'm in a meeting. It's all there for you. Okay, so how do we get it to roll? Is there a sound? Start again. No sound, Jake. Oh, is there no sound? No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> hmm. Strange. Let's Anyhow. Oh, there um, we go. For some reason there wasn't sound. Let me know if it starts now. That's Does this look familiar? Yep. There's the breakfast That's fruit fine. drink. The long ride to work energizer the mid-morning quencher and the sodas at dinner time but that many sugary drinks a day add up to more than 50 teaspoons and could bring on obesity which could lead to type 2 diabetes heart disease and even some cancers are you drinking yourself sick drink water instead a message from the heart foundation of jamaica the ministry of health jamaica moves thank you very much right. <laughs> Sorry about the technical thing there. No problem. Anipia, okay. thank you. Um, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't believe you'd manage all those slides um, in such a, a brilliant timing. But uh, and they carried so much uh, information. So thank you very much. Um, we have some questions in the in the chat. I'd like to, and I'll ask people to. Um, raise their own questions. I'll, I'll invite um, Dr. Lola Oni, uh, Molly, Carol Baldwin to ask their questions, but I'd, I'd like to ask one first. Um, how would you, what's your advice in terms of taxing sugar and taxing SSBs, sugar, sugary beverages? I think most, certainly we in the UK have gone for 
taxing sugary beverages. But I've always felt almost intellectually that taxing the sugar at source might be better. Um, but what's what's your view of the balance between the two? Um, I would go for a very focused tax on sugar sweetened beverages, because I think for the reasons I explained in the discussion, sugar in drinks is so much more dangerous than sugar in foods. And really, we don't need to be drinking sugar. Um, we can everything, you know, you can drink water and get your calories from food. So I would definitely go for the taxing the sugar sweetened beverages. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lola Oni, are you there and able to take off your mute and yes, ask I your am. question? Great. Hi. Good yes, to see thank you. you. Thank you very much. A wonderful presentation. Um, and like a lot of other people, I'm just as guilty as everyone else. Um, I've had a sweet tooth since I was a child. So you can imagine um, try to change your taste buds to recognize that you don't need all that sugar it can be quite challenging. Um, so some, somewhere along the line, we need to start from very, very young age, especially, particularly amongst the, the black population. Um, I think we really have a major problem. My question was um, really related to policy decision making and whether, you know, government should, you, you've touched on a lot of it in terms of taxation, but whether government should go a bit further um, in terms of ensuring that we are able to, to make the right choices, so to speak. I know we're not a nanny state, but, you know, sometimes right. I think make the right choices for people. Right. So just to start with your first comment about sweet tooth, you know, you can have fruits, right? So satisfy your sweet tooth with fruits. OK, so you will be good to go. Right. <laughs> OK. Um, so in terms of the approach and the policies and so on, as I mentioned, a number of different policies have been tried in different places. Um, and, you know, the political realities are always there to bite people. Um, remember that a lot of these countries have a lot of money and a lot of them contribute to political campaigns. Mm. Um, so in the democratic societies where people have to face the polls, um, money is important for them to run their campaign. So you find that there is influence um, that occurs in these in these settings. Um, but therefore, that is why the, it is important for civil society and citizens in general to raise their voices around the question of obesogenic environments. So it's, you know, the, the companies and everybody, oh, you just need a little self-control, you know, exercise a little bit more. It's all on you. It's your fault, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, relentless marketing, right? Which has an effect because if it doesn't have an effect, they wouldn't spend the money on marketing. Mm -hmm. So every million dollars they spend on marketing, they get $2 million more in sales. That's why they do it, right? So they are pushing consumption and then saying to you, oh, you just need to practice a little self-control. So you have to legislate tax legislation, taxation, regulations. We can't fight them on the health education. I told the Minister of Health in Jamaica the other day, I say, you guys have been spending money on health promotion for years and mm -hmm. every risk factor is increasing. So that's mm -hmm. not working, right? You have to do something that works. Taxation, legislation, regulations. Yeah. Thank you. Absol absolutely. One of C3's um, programs is a community engagement program using, um, using an app that works with local people really to interrogate their food environment. And um, we did that recently in um, a, an area of North London with a group of black women. And they, they went into shops that they normally go into and they'd never really looked at where the sugary things were, were placed. The messages, <laughs> how difficult it is to find. And that's even without looking at the cost of cheap thing, uh, uh, bad things rather than the cost of, of good things. So uh, absolutely. Um, Molly, you were asking a question, a bit similar to mine, but please do ask it about sugar tax. Do you come off mute? Hi, Christine. Hi, Hi. Oh, nice to meet you. Um, so beautiful presentation, um, uh, very, uh, very interesting lesson. Um, I just, uh, I was, uh, my question was really uh, that 
of course sugar uh, sweetened beverages are are high uh, i high are high in sugar levels uh, but what about um, you know uh, food food items directed particularly at children so uh, there are a lot of popular brands that are aimed directly uh, uh, you know for marketing um, at children's aisles so things like ella and organics so they use really clever marketing terms to label the ingredients and that can really bluff parents whilst you know checking for sugar content things like um, uh, they'd say um, uh, uh, fruit sweeteners so something like fructose and uh, fructose and corn syrup and things like that which is also not very healthy but because it says fruit sweeteners um parents are bluffed into thinking that this is healthy because this is just uh, you know made out of fruit and sweets in the right. fruit right um so this is something really concerning because all these kids they are eating them thinking that it's healthy and the parents are convinced like you know they're they're giving them healthy snacks but it's mm-hmm. in a way setting bad habits right from the start um so uh i just right. feel thank you mm-hmm. Right, so I think that um, really the answer to that is front of package labeling, because as, I, as we saw on one of the slides, there are about 20 different names for sugar, right? And none of us know all the 20 names. So clear front of package labeling and industry citing that because they know how effective it is. They have seen what happened in Chile and they know how effective it is. And so they're fighting with their all their strength. Um, but I believe Mexico has recently introduced um, these front of package labels because they also have significant problems. Um, and there may be some other countries. So um, my short response to, to your issue around lack of knowledge is make the knowledge simple and put it on the front of the package. Yes. Right. Yes. So thank you. Um, Carol Baldwin, um, who's one of several people who are uh, practicing nurses or uh, with backgrounds in nursing, and asks a question about people working night shifts. Hi, Carol. Hi, Christine. It's good to see you. And thank you so much for a really wonderful presentation. This was interesting and in some respects an eye-opener. I do have a colleague at uh, Arizona State University who's published. He's an attorney at our uh, law school who's published uh, papers on taxes and sugar sweetened beverages. But my concern has been night workers, uh, shift workers, uh, prim- primarily nights. And it would include nurses and firefighters and police. And I've actually talked with colleagues in Mexico about this. So they don't get at, they generally don't get adequate sleep. And when they're working nights, They're consuming sugar-sweetened beverages and what we call uh, junk food or chatara in Mexico. And um, I'm wondering if uh, you're familiar with any studies uh, related to the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages in particular and uh, with these power drinks that are high in sugar and caffeine that night workers use to stay awake, but in in the short term and in particular, the long term, it results in obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Are are, are you familiar with any uh, studies or any work that's been done with night workers and these SSBs? No, no, I'm not familiar with any specific work on night workers, but what I do know from having done night work myself Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, back in the day, is mm-hmm. that um, that burst of energy, you really need that burst of energy because you know it, it, at four o'clock in the morning, you are about to sleep regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we, it, it is a problem and I think um, we should probably turn our minds to see how else we can assist night workers to have a more healthy diet. Um, and part of the whole problem around healthy diet has to do with convenience, mm-hmm. right? And right. a lot of the times, the more healthy foods are not as convenient. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're in an emergency room and you get a break at four o'clock in the morning to do something, you know, you're not going to sit down and peel an orange or, you know, eat a mango, you know what I mean? So one of the challenges that 
we need to address going forward is, is there a way for us to make healthy food more convenient? Because until we do that, I think we're going to be at a dis disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Agreed, yeah. thank you very much. Um, As a night worker, I understand. Yeah. And that, um, I think that links also to the question that uh, Flory has just um, posted. And I had to um, persuade her to give us her name. Um, talking about convenience food, Flory, are you there to ask your question? Yeah, I am. Uh, what have you done to reduce con consumption by getting rid of convenience? You know, the, what I mean by that is having all these dispensers that are full of sweetened beverage, beverages and foods, which is uh, pretty endemic here in the UK. I'm in England. And in fact, this morning I was walking one of the with one of the catering managers and I was having I was showing him that nearly all the food that they're serving in all the restaurants within our work area is full of sugar laden foods and drinks as well you know i'm trying to campaign that we get rid of all this sugar uh, sweetened beverages for a start and i said to them why don't we jump on the bandwagon of keto it's uh, the latest thing shall we do something towards that but as they said it's a convenience and of course it's cheap i mean what can we do about that apart from tax as well is the big question isn't it Right. And here, here's the, the conundrum that I think we face in this kind of situation, right? Um, as someone said earlier, this is not a nanny state and none of these foods are illegal. So it's persuasion when we're talking about the public, because you can't force people to eat food that they don't want to eat. And people want unhealthy food. Okay, it tastes good. So what we can do is use fiscal incentives to make it more expensive because that works. We know supply and demand works, right? If the price goes up, consumption will go down. Um, and I think this is the, the main way we can use because, you know, I heard somebody say once we should just ban sugar. You can't do that. It's a, it's, it's a democracy. You can't ban legal substances. Um, so we have to find ways to work around that. It's also very hard to bake a cake without any sugar. It uh, doesn't stand up too well. Um, right, no, and sugar is, sugar is not a poison. Sugar is not trans fat, right? Our body uses glucose to power our body. Um, so, you know, we, we do need sugar. Um, the question is the form that it comes in and the quantity and the fact that the quantities of, you, you remember that graph I showed you the, the Caribbean where the, the red was like literally off the charts. We cannot continue to, to, to eat like that. It's, it's killing us. Absolutely. So I wanted to pick up this wonderful label the uh, Lancet gave you um, of being the fast food watchdog. Um, because I think um, I, you're absolutely right, obviously, sugar sweetened beverages are the major cause of, uh, of sugar. But the fast food epidemic, um, yeah. certainly in the UK, is a major contributor, I think. Um, and we, um, doing our community engagement programme in part of um, South of England, we, um, we met with a, a nurse who recently, fairly recently come to this country from Ghana and she had put on nine pounds in weight in the few months that she'd been here, which was sort of shocking. Um, and I was speaking to somebody else, um, a teacher in the South of England, who said she heard one of her colleagues say to somebody who just, um, who'd come from another country, when you're in England, you're put on weight. Um, and I think the prevalence of fast food, and I wonder whether any, you've come across anywhere that's tried to recognize the need for convenience and fast food, but try to do it in a more healthy way. Or are the two, do the two have to go together? Fast food and unhealthiness. No, no, no. In fact, um, there is a, a chain of restaurants in Jamaica called Island Grill that the university, um, my department actually gave an award to for producing healthy 
quote unquote fast food. She calls it quick service. She says she's not fast food, she's quick service. Um, but it, you know, they set up right beside Kentucky in a number of places and they offer, you know, real food, you know, rice and, and curry chicken and, and, you know, that kind of thing. Jerk, you know, jerk is a big thing in, in Jamaica. It's a kind of barbecue over the open fire. Um, and they do offer a more healthy option, but I have to unfortunately report that because of COVID and the demands of COVID, they have actually added some unhealthy foods to their diets, to their menu, because they need to survive. Mm -hmm. um, they're business people, they need to survive. Um, but still, at base, they do offer a much healthier option than the deep fat fried, you know, chicken and chips. Uh, when did when did when did French fries become the food of the world? I mean, <laughs> everywhere you go in the world now, right? Yeah. French fries. What, what what when did this happen? <laughs> and what's wrong with uh, rice? <laughs> <laughs> what what what? <laughs> so Natalie, you you raised something about um, labeling. Did you want to raise that as well with uh, Dr. Samuels? Hi, Dr. Summers. Thank you very much for your very good uh, presentations. Um, yes, you talked about uh, the warning labels uh, in front of the package. Uh, so it, yes, it started in uh, Chile, but they, they do have it in uh, several countries like in Brazil. And um, so I, I wanted um, you to tell us exactly what happened with that because you, they tried to introduce it, yes, and in Caribbean and then uh, it was difficult, so I guess it was political, it was uh, food industry, because from my view, because it's a shift in uh, uh, behavior change, it's it's quite a good, a good tool, even if you, obviously, as you said, we can't uh, uh, forbid all these products, but uh, the, the sooner the children learn that it's not that good and they have other choice, the better, but I know there is a lot of buyers and uh, it's very difficult, so I'd like you to talk about it, how it the process. <laughs> Yes, so um, the Caribbean has a grouping, a political grouping called the Caribbean Community CARICOM, and it's made up of 20 um, mostly islands with uh, Belize, Suriname, Guyana's mainland countries because of their historical whatever, right? So we have this group and um, there is a, an organization called CROSQ, which is a Caribbean Regional Organization for Standards and Quality. And the idea was that we would, at a regional level, pass a recommended standard for labeling. It would still have to be implemented in each country, but in the Caribbean, we do a lot of things together. So we went to CARICOM and we, we tried to get the, this thing done. So what happened was that in each country, you had a committee that needed to vote. And the committee had membership from across the society, including the private sector, government, you know, various places. And um, in CARICOM, you need, um, I think it's a 75% positive um, or 80% for it to be passed as a regional standard. And in the end, some countries abstained um, and some voted for it, but not enough. So industry was able to, to find a way um, to, to get, you know, like for example, in Jamaica, they had the meeting of the committee and they voted one way. And then a, a, another meeting of the same committee was called and then the vote went another way. So there was a lot of maneuvering that went on and we know industries behind that. Um, and in the end at CARICOM, it was not passed. Um, Industry now claims that they are doing research to discover the best front of package label because they are in support of front of package labels, but it has it can't be imported from outside and the Chile model is not working for us and we need to get our own model and we need to have different models in different. And so basically what they're trying to do now is to just water it down as much as they can. Different labels for different packages so nobody knows exactly what's going on. And, you know, so that is in process. They are trying to do this research, which is supposed to prove which label is best for Jamaica. Um, I, yeah, so it's, it's a process, it's a problem. Thank you very much. But 
the very last um, question, Denise, uh, are you able to ask your question about? Um, sure. Is, yeah, carry on. Sure. Um, so my question is really about um, uh, just uh, if whether or not the sugar content um, in, in uh, soda is different in the island states, because I know that does happen for uh, different countries around the world. I know Coca-Cola has been known to do that. Yes. Um, and if that's the case, then what do you think about the idea of having counter advertising, um, letting the public know that, you know, that sugar content is really high and this is done intentionally because what we found with the work that Christine's mentioned previously um, about our community engagement strategy is that when you make people angry, if they've been fooled by somebody, that they're more likely to pay attention and to be and want to engage in change. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, the thing is that people want these products. People love the sugar. Um, we started out, as you know, slave colony and growing sugar cane. Um, and we have had a great relationship with sugar all through our history. Um, right now, we're not selling sugar to the EU anymore because they have blocked us. So a lot of the sugar is being um, made into alcohol, which is a whole nother topic for another day, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, 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 don't, I don't know um, if people would be, I, I mean, all right, so let me, let me just go back to this thing. So they, they quoted me as fast food watchdog of the Caribbean. That came from when I was living in Barbados and I kept talking about Shefet and Shefet selling to the children and so on and so forth. When the articles would appear in the newspapers in Barbados, the parents, some of the parents were the first to attack me. Leave Shefet alone. They give us things. They give my children a backpack. They give, they support the sports day. They give them pencil cases. No mind the pencil case has Shefet on it. But the parents came out in defense of Shefet, some of them. And it's, you know, it's, it's what they do. It's what they know. It's what they like. Their taste buds have been made accustomed to this high sugar over time. The marketing is reinforcing that this is a good thing. And this lonely academic who doesn't know what she's talking about. And, you know, she doesn't know what my life is like. What, 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 what is she saying? So they're, they're with Shefet. A lot of the public, we opened, the, not we, a new Kentucky Fried Chicken opened very close to where I live, um, which is on the tourist coast. And the lines outside the KFC are already around the block. So we should not underestimate the demand that average people have for unhealthy food. They like it, it tastes good. It does taste good. Um, and just to mention, yes, there are different rules in different countries. Um, and, and they will formulate according to the country. Um, and, you know, even laws. So for example, in the United States, trans fat is banned, but in the Caribbean, it's not. So you can be sure that a lot of the fast food we're getting in the Caribbean has trans fat. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. No, it's a challenge, but thank you. Thank you. That's for the excellent presentation. Yeah. And it's hard not to end on a slightly pessimistic note. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but your your presentation was um, exciting and optimistic, and I'm I'm going to go with the watchdog. We had a similar experience in this country. You probably read that um, Jamie Oliver, one of our sort of famous TV chefs, persuaded schools to produce healthy food, and there were pictures of mums and dads posting burgers and chips through the school railings to make sure their children didn't do without. So uh, we, we've also seen the power of unhealthy parents, really. Um, yes. and, it's, uh, <laughs> and, and this is all without mentioning price, which again is uh, a big issue around. Dr. Samuels, thank you so much for absolutely scintillating um, presentation, a great way to think seriously and positively about World Obesity Day. And I'm sure you'll be doing lots more during today um, because Johanna Ralston from World Obesity recommended you as our speaker for World Obesity Day. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, we thank hope that we'll me. be in contact again in different ways, but we'll certainly remember your presentation and it will be available to everybody on our YouTube channel. 
Thank you. Thank Goodbye, you. everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.